This next video looks at analyzing the model once we've built it. The prior video showed how we calculate the values of B0 and B1. Now we're interested in answering some other questions, such as how well did the model perform, and what part of the data is error, and what part of the data is systematic. We can calculate confidence intervals for these B0 and B1 values, and then how do we interpret that? Then, most importantly for engineers and scientists, is finding prediction estimates from the model. We'll get to the topic of confidence intervals and prediction estimates next, but in this video, I want to understand and analyze how the model is performing. To do that, we have to understand and go back to the concept of variance. We said, at the start of this course, that life with no variance is pretty boring, a flat line. That flat line, for the purposes of analyzing variance, will be our base case, the situation of doing nothing, of essentially building a model where the predicted value of y is a horizontal line. If we look at the formula for the least squares model, the situation when we get a flat line is when y hat is equal to b naught, just the intercept. The interpretation of this base model, of doing nothing, is simply to say that we do not have any structure in our data. We have random noise. The best prediction of y that you could give someone would just be the calculated average, y bar, of all those values. But the least squares model is more than that. There is also a slope. We're going to take the model from being an intercept only model and add a slope, a b1 multiplied by xi term. So what we're asking then is, what is the improvement in the model's predictions when we go from that case of essentially a horizontal line to the case when we add some slope to our model? Once we've added that slope, We've essentially finished building the least squares model, but there's going to be some error in our predictions. We're not going to fit that least squares model perfectly to our data points. So let me quickly recap. We're going to start off with a horizontal line, then we're going to ask, what is the change in adding a slope? And then we're going to estimate how much variance is left over in the errors. We'll add these components up, and they'll add up to the total variance. Looking back at the formula for variance, Variance is defined as the deviation from a mean, y bar. So what we will have, actually, for our base case is a value of variance of zero, since there is no deviation from this horizontal line. Now when we go and add some sort of slope to our model, essentially what we're doing is explaining some variability in the data. We're going to move b1 away from zero to some non-zero value and stop when we find a slope that best explains the data. Now what we have to ask ourselves is how much variability was explained in the data with that additional slope term, and then how much variability is left over in the errors. This is what this video is about, quantifying the variability explained by the model and quantifying how much variability is left over in the errors. If we go back to these objectives right at the start of this video, I said that we would look at how much of the data is signal, in other words, how much we can explain, versus how much of the data is noise, the part that we cannot explain. And that's all that the analysis of variance ANOVA table does for us. You've likely heard that term before, so we're going to look at that and build up that concept. All that the analysis of variance does is break down which part of our data is signal and which part of it is noise, how much of it can we explain, and how much of it is left over in the errors. Now I recognize this concept can be fairly intimidating, so what I will do is look at it from two ways, purely algebraically and geometrically. And by the end of this video, we'll derive two extreme forms of least squares models. All future least squares models that you derive will lie somewhere between those two extreme types. So to explain analysis of variance, let's look at this plot. We have a regression line already fitted over here. Notice that, as we've said before, the regression line must pass through x bar and y bar. We derived that in the prior video. Here is one of the data points used to build the model, xi, yi, up over here. There are three distances that are of interest to us. Remember, I said that our base case will be the horizontal line, y bar. The first distance that we will consider is the distance from the data point, yi, to the line, y bar. We will call that the total sum of squares. You will see why we call it that in a minute, the distance from the data point to the base case. Now we have another distance to consider. When we have that xi value over here, 
The best estimate for the prediction of y is the point on the line. This vertical distance, reg ss, the regression sum of squares, is the distance from the prediction point on the line to our base case. That is y hat i minus y bar. And then we have one distance left over, the residual sum of squares, or rss. That's the distance from the actual data point to the prediction line. Geometrically, we're seeing the breakdown happening here. The deviation from the prediction on the line to our base case, and then the deviation from the actual data point to the prediction. These two portions, REGSS and RSS, add up and equal the TSS, the total sum of squares. Now let's go look at this algebraically. That total deviation, yi minus y bar, can be written here on the left-hand side, and it's equal to the sum of two components. The first component is the prediction y hat minus y bar, and the second component is the distance from y i to y hat. So we can see that geometrically and algebraically. That equation is written for a single value y i. We can now square that term on the left-hand side and square it on the right-hand side. Then the third line here in the derivation shows us rewriting this equation for every single data point in our data set and summing up those squared terms. There are n terms in the summation on both sides. The left-hand side here, the total sum of squared deviations from our base case. We call that the total sum of squares. And you can see that that formula looks remarkably similar to the variance of y. The two other deviation terms on the right-hand side are similar. The first one is the regression sum of squares, indicated by the regression deviations. The second part on the right-hand side is the residual sum of squares, what's remaining after we have made our predictions from that first term. The second term quantifies what's left over. What part did we not predict? There we see, kind of intuitively, what the least squares model is doing. We're taking a total amount of variance here on the left and breaking it up into two parts on the right. The first part is the part we can predict, the regression sum of squares. The second part is the portion we cannot predict, the residual sum of squares. To end off this video, I would like you to complete this really important exercise, which we will continue on with. Draw two sets of axes, one on the left and one on the right of your page. On the right set of axes, please draw the case with approximately 10 data points, where those data points follow the linear model exactly, with no error. The x values and the y values are perfectly correlated. This is the best case you could ever have. What does the least squares model look like? Now I'd like you to draw the left-hand plot. This is the case when there is no structure to the data. The data are essentially random numbers. There is no correlation at all between the x variable and the y variable. What does the least squares model look like for this situation? That left-hand plot is maybe a little harder than the right-hand side. Did you get something that looks like this? On the left, we see no correlation between the x and y data. There is no structure. The best least squares model we can fit is a horizontal line that goes through the average of that data cloud. The right-hand side model is easier. It shows perfectly correlated data, and the least squares line passes exactly through all the points. The left case is the worst situation and the right case is the best. Any future least squares model you build will lie somewhere in between these two situations. And all that analysis of variance does is it helps to quantify for us where we are between these two extremes. Now this is the harder part, but try this anyway. With this made-up data set, what would be the following values that could go into these blanks? I'm not looking for accurate numbers. Just figure out if the number will be zero, small, or large, and what the sign of the number will be. What are the six numbers for these two extreme cases? Did you get these results? For the uncorrelated case on the left, we see that the predicted value, y hat, is just equal to the average y bar value. So the regression sum of squares is zero. There is nothing to predict in this extreme situation. And because y hat is equal to y bar, we have that the residual sum of squares will be some large positive value. Remember, we are summing squares, so it has to be positive. The total sum of squares, TSS, for this case, is the same large positive value as RSS because y hat i is equal to y bar. 
So in summary, in the worst case regression, RSS and TSS are the same numeric values, and the regression sum of squares is zero. In the best case situation, we have that the prediction, y hat, is exactly the same as the measured value, yi. So this term, regression sum of squares, will be a large positive value. It will also be the same large positive value for the total sum of squares, TSS, because yi is equal to y hat i. And in this case here on the right, the residual distances observed minus predicted, or yi minus y hat i, will be zero in every single case. There are no residuals. So this sum of squares is equal to zero. So two extremes, which you should hopefully never encounter in practice. And if you do, you've got a problem with your data. You should be somewhere in between these two situations. So to finish off this fairly lengthy exercise, I'd like you now to calculate this ratio. What is the regression sum of squares divided by TSS? Pause the video and write those two numbers down. For the worst case situation, it will be zero because the numerator is zero. For the best case situation, it will be one because both numerator and denominator are the same values. Now this ratio is what you've called R squared all along and I hope it gives some new interpretation for R squared. A zero value of R squared implies your line is flat and horizontal with no slope term. B1 is equal to zero. Values of R squared closer to one imply your predictions are close to your measured values. Coming up, we're going to take a much closer look at R squared and its companion value, the standard error, as a way to interpret our model's performance.